Hello. Um, so our next speaker is going to be Xu Jin. Um, Xu Jin is now at McGill University. Uh, and before that, she was at Edinburgh, uh, where we have a chance to work together. And now she's running her own lab, and she's going to talk today about her latest work. Thank you very much. Okay, um, thanks for the introduction. And I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation. Um, I'm really glad to be here to share some highlights of my work. So a lot of my work was uh, motivated, by, motivated by the need of exploring robots to the real world environment. So like many other speakers here want to send a robot to outdoor, but there are a couple of questions that we need to answer ahead of time. Um, one question why I was interested is how can we make robots safer in the environment with us? So we give the robot some task and a human happened to, be, happened to stay in the way. How can we control a robot so we, we don't enjoy the person? But at the meanwhile, we don't want the robot to fail as well. And another question that I was interested in is how can we make a robot work over different kind of environment without we providing the information ahead of time? Um, so this start with my work on um, compliant motion control. So this is the first question that I was working on along this line. Um, we have a robot holding an object. Uh, we have an evil human trying to interact with the object. Um, and we don't know what the human wants. Um, so then the question is, how can the robot be compliant to human interaction? But in the meanwhile, we don't want the robot to lose the object because maybe it's carrying something important. So we know there are a couple of forces reacting at the same time. And the question is, how can we control robot torque so we can balance all this out? So I believe a lot of people here are familiar with this equation. So we have um, a robot in contact. That means we need a rich body dynamics and an extra time to describe the contact force. And a lot of time what we do is um, if we contact, we optimize the contact force with respect to the um, unit actual and friction point constraint. And what we are trying to do here is, we know humans are trying to interact with the robot. Uh, we don't know what the human wants, but we will call all then the ethanol force. Um, we estimate this ethanol force ourselves, and then we put it back to the equation of motion so we can compensate it accordingly. So um, we can formulate as a typical constraint optimization problem. So like many other people is doing here, we need to minimize the torque with respect to the unilateral and friction cone constraint. And of course you can add other constraints as well. But um, the difference here is because um, we estimate the as no force and put it back to the equation of motion. So the torque and your contact force here has this information of our estimated um, as no force. So that means you the the optimal torque that you found is more robust to the snow force. So here's one of the example that we started. We have a bimanual robot holding an object and a human is trying to uh, interact with the robot. So it's very similar to like when we grasp an object and if someone is trying to take it away from us, uh, a very intuitive way that we will do is we will grasp the object harder. And this is basically what we are trying to teach a robot to achieve. And this idea is quite generic. So we use it for quadruped robot as well. So um, the, the original idea is if one day we want the robot to work on the street, it might bump into a human at some point, right? Which is something that we can really avoid, um, but we don't want to injure the person. But at the meanwhile, we don't want the robot to fall. So um, in this case, we need to make sure that robot is compliant enough when you bump into something. But at the meanwhile, we want to make sure you maintain a certain amount of contact force so it doesn't slip away. So in this case, we use a similar idea. We um, estimate the amount of S no force at the body. But at the meanwhile, um, when we optimize the contact force with the flower, because we have this information about the S no force coming from a human, um, the contact force we optimize is robust to the, the disturbances. And we like this idea so much, we use it for human eye as well. Uh, so in this case, you see human eye holding an object. We, try, we are trying to achieve something similar. Um, we can be compliant. Uh, the robot can be compliant to human interaction. But in the meanwhile, it knows it needs to grasp the object hard and it needs to maintain contact force with the blower. 
And the second focus of my work is about uh, motion adaptation. So um, I would say a typical way to start uh, learning some demonstration is you have some data and then we process the data and we supervise learning to learn a policy that can describe your data. Or some people might be more familiar with reinforcement learning that doesn't require much more data. So uh, one interesting question that I would like to, uh, I was working on is, they say we learn the policy from some kind of demonstrations. And one day we happen to see something a little bit similar, but not identical. Um, can we just adopt the previous policy instead of learning from scratch? And the reason is because everyone, every time we want to do imitation learning, we either take a lot of the time to collect the data, processing the data, or we spend a lot of time doing the exploration to collect the data ourselves. So instead of relearning from scratch, maybe we can do some kind of motion adaptation to save some of the human labor in between. So our idea is um, maybe we can find, we can express it as a kind of constraints and then we find the projection matrix they can do this adaptation. So here's one very simple toy three-dimensional example. Uh, we have a kind of table surface and we have some kind of human demonstrations which is made like a circular motion on your table surface. Then you can imagine you have some kind of observation that's like on the image space of, of kind of, of projection matrix. So we don't know what the projection matrix so our goal is maybe we can find a projection matrix that can achieve this motion. So for this, we come up with this uh, error functional. And so then the goal is, can we just take a data and to figure out what's a projection matrix that can do this? And um, previously we formulated this as a kernel regression problem, but I believe it's other kind of supervised learning uh, algorithm will do the trick as well. So here's one of the examples that we tried. Um, we want to teach a robot how to use the remote control of an air conditioner. So for human, um, one thing that we do typically is we use our thumb to press a button and we use our fingers to hold the remote control itself. And so this is the kind of control that we try to teach the robot in this experiment. So in the training phase, we collect a lot of data of robot repeatedly press the button to decrease the temperature of the room. And then we use the, uh, the objective function I introduced the last slides to learn the projection matrix that can do this trick. And in the testing phase, uh, we want to do something slightly different, but similar. In this case, we want to use the thumb to increase the temperature instead. Um, so what we did is we take the previous learn projection matrix with the new task together, and they will reproduce the motion like this. Okay, and uh, we borrow this idea to um, estimate the content constraints for leggy robot as well. So um, in this problem, um, what we are trying to do is we want to bring robot to outdoor environment. So uh, for example, today we see a lot of examples of people bring the robot to do an inspection task. Um, in this picture, we want to bring the robot to a mine. Um, but there are a lot of issues that we might face in environment like that um, because your vision system might fail. So in a tunnel like this, you might have a, uh, the tunnel might be very dusty or it can be very foggy, very dark. So your light down may not work well. And if your terrain is covered with water, we can really see what the terrain looks like. And on top of that, we can really see, uh, we can really visualize how slippery the terrain is. But then we, we, but on the other side, we also don't want to provide this information to the robot ahead of time. So the question is, how can we, um, how can a robot work in this kind of environment without knowing the information and without a vision system? So um, if you do model-based control for legged robot, you know, we always need to do one thing is, uh, we need to optimize the contact force with respect to the fission constraints. Um, so what we are looking for is the minimum information we need <clears throat> is, the, is the contact normal and the fission coefficient for our controller. So we can optimize the contact force accordingly. So our idea is um, instead of giving this information to a robot, we use one of the lake as a haptic sensor 
and then we touch it around to figure out what the terrain looks like. So it's a bit like, you know, when human uh, in a very dark room, something we'll do is we use our hand touch it around to figure out the environment before we make a move. And this is quite similar to that. So um, while the robot is touching the environment, we can estimate those information. And when you feel it's confident enough, then we can make a move. So this is one of the example that we brought the robot to. Um, this is a sewer in Switzerland. Uh, I guess you are very, like me, you are very impressed by how clean the sewer is in Switzerland. But <laughs> we, we, so that is, we never uh, seen this sewer before. The, no, the robot doesn't know what the terrain looks like. It doesn't know how slippery it is. Uh, but what we want is we take the robot to a sewer. It doesn't, um, before it start walking, we use this kind of um, estimation method to find out what kind of, um, what kind of coefficient should we provide to a controller before you make a move. And lastly, I want to highlight that uh, this is what's mostly my work when I was a postdoc at the University of Edinburgh. And I recently started a, a new position at McGill University. And my focus is, I'm continuing working with uh, leg locomotion, but my focus current days is more for uh, motion planning, but how can we do motion planning um, in a faster and more stable way, either through optimal control or through machine learning. And another research area that I'm working on is um, how do we do motion adaptation? Not just across different tasks, but maybe we can do across different robots as well. Okay, uh, thank you again. And I will take any questions. Okay, thank you, Xujin, for your interesting talk. And I will look at the chat where we have some questions. Um, it seems not yet, so I will ask the question. So um, what was the, um, let's say, major obstacles when you were turning your optimization into the real legged robots? Uh, I think one thing about this, um, we are trying to optimize the contact force with the estimated SNO force. And when we estimate, when we try to estimate this SNO force, of course, we're taking the, the data coming from the robot. And it, of course, it comes with noise. And what we are trying to do there is we take this estimation and try to optimize the torque in every single time step. So if you have any kind of noise in your estimation, those noise will affect or reflect on your torque as well. And of course, then you'll see the robot start shaking because your torque is too sensitive to the noise. So I think there was one of the obstacles, but um, but having said that, I would say at the end, our solution is instead of looking at the uh, reading coming from the, we actually didn't use any um, result from the post-talk sensor because it was just too noisy. Uh, we estimate the external force completely based on perception because it was less, a little bit less noisy than the, than the post-talk sensor itself. But still, when you go through some filter before we can put it back to the optimization loop. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much for your answer. And